Welcome to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today, an experiment using new CRISPR gene editing techniques that could save the lives of patients with diseases that are difficult to treat. We've been able to bring a new treatment into play for a group of patients that would otherwise not have an option. In fact, almost every condition that affects the development of the blood, bone marrow, immune systems, there's dozens of genes that could be amenable to correction using some of these techniques. I did think of dying a little bit. It just all seemed a bit hopeless. And obviously I was still determined to keep going. And I wanted to be cured, but like, we'd just been put down so many times. And if I do pass away from having this trial, or I pass away after and it don't work for me, at least me doing the trial will be helping other people. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. In 2021, right before Easter, Kiona Tapley saw a change in her daughter, Alyssa. We noticed Alyssa seemed really tired a lot of the time. She wasn't eating very much. Things she used to enjoy doing, she didn't enjoy doing as much. She just turned 12, so we were like, oh, maybe it's like the age. It's like she's becoming a teenager, you know, when they're supposed to get like a little bit grumpy, a little bit more stubborn, all that kind of thing. So we began to put it down to that to begin with. And then after Easter, she she went back to school. And then she started to get like, it seemed to be one cold after another. She was very tired. She didn't want to go to school. And we couldn't put our fingers on anything that it was. Alyssa ended up in the emergency room near her home in England. After seeing the assessment nurse, we went into a small room and they started to discuss with us like what had been going on, how Alyssa had been feeling. And then a second doctor came in and then he runs out of the room and he says, can I have some help, please? And then before you know it, like a team of um, doctors and nurses have come in and they've rushed her into a larger room. At this point, they've put her on oxygen, And it's just kind of all actions go. It's kind of the sort of thing that you see in a film. And then they said, we'd like you to speak to our haematology consultant. And he said, we think we're 99% sure that Alyssa has leukemia. It was acute limblastic leukemia. But rather than being the B cell, which is the more common type, it was actually T cell. T-cell leukemia was more challenging to treat, but still had a high success rate. And while Alyssa was sedated, she received two rounds of chemotherapy to start her treatment. Once she woke up, her mother gave her the news. I was, I was really, really upset, obviously. At first, it was hard because I had a feeding tube. I didn't like anything that I used to eat before. I felt sick all the time. I was in pain all the time. I missed all my friends. And it was just very, very isolating for the first part of my treatment. The doctors said that Alyssa's treatment was standard and fairly straightforward. It's four weeks of intensive chemo. And they explain like the first four weeks is the hardest. And then you'll have six months of potentially some other chemotherapy, but hopefully you won't be as poorly. And then by the time you're on your maintenance, you'll be back at school. So we were thinking, Alyssa will be back in school in six months. And in two years time, it will be a distant memory. But that's not what happened. It turned out Alyssa's leukemia was resistant to chemotherapy. I was very afraid. And, like, just the point where you thought the hardest bit was over, it was more like the hardest bit is to come. There's, like, that part of me that just didn't want to do it anymore, wanted to give up. But then there was another part of me who was like, but there's all my family at home waiting for me to come. Alyssa prepared for more treatment. 
I knew I was going to lose my hair, so I shaved it all off. It was still like furry at the top. And then when I eventually got home, I shaved it off more so it was more prickly. And I donated my hair to the Little Princess Trust, which is a wig charity in England. Alyssa went through another round of treatment, this time with a more intensive chemotherapy. She'd be having a drug called Nerablin, which is like quite a harsh chemotherapy that they tried not to give to children unless they thought it was necessary. She had another bone marrow aspirate and it hadn't worked at all. So even though they said like, we've pretty much thrown all the chemo we can at it, it's quite chemo resistant. And if anything, the leukemia was going higher. So I was actually in the room with Alyssa when the doctor came in and said, Mrs. Tapley, can I have a word with you? And he basically told us that Alyssa needs a bone marrow transplant. That actually only a few children with leukemia actually had to have. So now it's not just about the leukemia potentially killing her. It's the actual process of the bone marrow transplant could kill her. We've always been very honest with Alyssa about what's been going on because from the very start, that's what she said she wanted. From the very beginning, she said, don't hide things from me. Don't lie to me. I want to know. Keona Tapley went into Alyssa's hospital room to tell her daughter that the chemotherapy didn't work and that she would need a bone marrow transplant. I wasn't really thinking about like what would happen with like the bone marrow transplant. I was kind of focusing on the now. I was trying to think of things that were more positive than negative. And I was obviously scared. I was upset that I would miss my brother and all my family and everything. I mean, Alyssa's always said to me, I'm not going to die. You know, it's been her that's almost been reassuring to me. You know, I've tried to hide my tears from Alyssa, having like a mini, you know, almost breakdown, like feeling the worst. And it'll be Alyssa that will come up to me and she goes, Mom, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to leave you, you know, and it's always been like my strength has actually come from her. She's always been very determined that, you know, she's going to she's going to beat this. She got over the bone marrow transplant really well. She came home a week earlier than we thought she would. So everything was looking amazing. You know, we couldn't be happier. And this was over Christmas. And then we found out a day before New Year's Eve that actually when they did her bone marrow aspirate, her leukemia level was the same as prior to the bone marrow transplant. My first thought was, please don't give up on me. I don't want to die. I was just a bit like, not that I couldn't believe it, but more like, this isn't happening to me. They said all conventional treatments we've gone down. At the moment, we're not looking at curing her leukemia. We're looking at keeping her alive for as long as possible. How do you tell your 13-year-old daughter that they're going to die at 13? I asked the question of how long. And they said with Alyssa that we're probably talking more weeks. Just because of how aggressive her leukemia is, We're talking weeks rather than months and definitely not years. And we did say we'd never lie to her. So we didn't lie to her. We just didn't tell her, if that makes sense. We just said, at the moment, there is nothing to cure your leukemia. So we're going to give you some medicine to keep it under control for as long as we can. And what she said was, are they giving up on me? Because that's almost how it feels, because all of a sudden... You've gone from people saying, oh, yes, we can do this, we can do that, to all of a sudden saying there's nothing we can do. And we were like, we'll never give up on you, ever. We'll fight until the very last moment. We spoke to the doctor and she said, I've been looking out for things. One of my colleagues at Great Ormond Street 
has mentioned they're going to be potentially starting a trial in the next few months. So we were like, oh my gosh, yes. Find out the information for us. Find out the details. We are interested. So we've gone from having absolutely zero hope whatsoever to, okay, we've got a tiny glimmer. It's not much. It's not a promise. But is there something there? I was over the moon. I was I was just like really, really happy that there was something else out there. And I also thought at least I've tried and if I do pass away from having this trial or I pass away after and it didn't work for me, at least me doing the trial will be helping other people. So we went to Great Ormond Street to meet the team and I think very much this was an interview for both of us. We were interviewing them to see, are these the people that we give our baby to? You know, what could potentially be the last couple of months of her life? If we do the trial, she could go into hospital and die. Do we have her in hospital the last few weeks of her life or do we keep her at home happy? Do we let her have the most amazing few weeks that she's got left with us as a family making beautiful memories or do we potentially put her on this trial that will make her really sick really weak she won't be able to see any family and friends and then she dies at the end of it without ever coming home and as harsh as that sounds that was the decision that we had to make and Alyssa made that decision for us I thought, if I die now, what have I done? I've not done anything with my life. So I was also thinking, like, if I do this, then my life will actually mean something to a lot of people. And I felt like, for me, that was one of the really important things why I took the trial. So when they gave us the CAR T, they explained that what these new T cells would go around and do was destroy the leukemia. And to do that, we might see things like a temperature, low blood pressure, neutrophils dropping. So we kind of knew what to look for for the indications that it was working, but obviously we wouldn't know for definite. We thought at this point we'd met with the hospital's palliative team and we had in place a procedure of what would happen if the leukemia hadn't gone, how she'd come home and go into her hospice. So that had all been set up ready. So at this point, we had two options. One, we would stay in hospital and have the bone marrow transplant. Or two, it wouldn't have been successful and we'd go home to an hospice and she would stay in there until till she passed away. Alyssa went through with the trial and got her infusion of CAR T-cells. And five weeks later, doctors tested her bone marrow. She was with her mother at a park across the street from the hospital when the doctor called. And he said, can you please come back to the hospital? (laughs) So we all thought something was wrong. And so we got up there preparing ourselves for like the worst. And then he came in and he said, We can't find any leukemia. (laughs) I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so happy. I think it was like the happiest day of my life. Alyssa has been in remission for one year and she is at this moment completely leukemia free. They can't find any leukemia whatsoever. To think that you're going to lose the most precious thing in your world to then have them sitting here and knowing that, you know what, hopefully, touch wood, she's going to live a long and happy life, which is all you wish for your children, isn't it? You know, we'd almost prepared ourselves for being a three-person family, you know, and that was the realism of it. Whereas now, all our plans are we're a four-person family and that's going forward is how we're able to plan now. (laughs) 
I'm so happy that I did do that trial and how much of an impact that it has made and is going to make in the future. And I think about the children who have just been diagnosed or maybe been just told they need to go for a bone marrow transplant. And I remember that time and I just, I wish the best for them as well. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. I'm joined now by Dr. Wasim Qasim. He's a professor of cell and gene therapy at University College London and a pediatric immunologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Dr. Wasim is author of a study being published in the New England Journal of Medicine that Alyssa Tapley took part in. Dr. Wasim, please tell us more about this study and the science that made it possible. Our objective is to try and bring new treatments to children in particular where there aren't any existing options for them. And in this particular case, this young lady had a type of leukemia that had arisen in her T lymphocytes. And unfortunately, she'd been through all the standard treatments and a bone marrow transplant, and the disease had come back. In parallel, we're running a whole range of trials to try and treat other types of leukemia, including B-cell leukemias, using CAR therapies. CAR Ts are T-cells that have been engineered to be able to detect and kill certain types of leukemia in particular. And most CAR T-cell therapy, the successful ones really, have focused on B-cell malignancies. And those treatments over the last 10 years or so have been shown to be highly effective in patients where other treatment options have not worked out. But there's very few options for patients with T-cell leukemia. And to be able to make a treatment in this situation, there's, there's a number of hurdles. Some of the hurdles relate to being able to collect cells from a patient who's had a lot of chemotherapy already and whether they'll work as a CAR therapy. And then secondly, there's the whole issue of training T-cells to fight other T-cells without fighting each other. The CAR T-cell treatments that have reached the market are mostly taking a patient's own cells, engineering them, giving them back. We've had an ambition. Can we take cells from a healthy donor and make a bank of cells that can be then given to multiple recipients. Imagine what that does to the ability to be able to give this to larger numbers of patients. So that's one development, being able to take the cells from another person, putting the engineering steps, the gene editing steps, base editing, to allow us to stop them being rejected by the host. And at the same time, we're now tackling a different type of leukemia, T-cell leukemia, So in combination, three editing steps to remove molecules on the surface of T-cells to allow them to be used off the shelf and to be able to have those cells ready, pre-manufactured and frozen, and to be able to give them in a timed way to patients who otherwise would not have treatment options. So basically, you had these obstacles. The patient couldn't use their own cells. The T-cells would kill each other. and graft versus host, and you used a special kind of gene editing to do something different that hasn't ever been done before. So we've had an interest in gene editing for some time now, and now most recently we managed to adopt base editing, and the platform had a major advantage in the way it works to knock out genes without causing double-strand DNA breaks. So if we're undertaking three separate edits, this is multiplexed editing, that introduces a risk of translocations between the sites of editing. But as soon as we switch to base editing, we're making changes to single letters of the DNA code to stop genes being expressed, but we're not causing a cut. So this is much gentler on the cells, is very targeted, and we were able to quickly move to a phase one study. What you mean is that the base editing, it doesn't cut the the DNA in a way that may damage it 
in the previous ways that we have done this CRISPR technology? So we made products for CAR-19, and at the end of production, we could see that a small percentage of cells, perhaps up to 5% of cells in the batch, carried changes in their chromosomes that had arisen because of the cutting of DNA and the movement of chromosomes at the sites of cuts. So these are translocations. Occasionally, we'd see a missing chromosome or a missing part of a chromosome. And the same has been described for other types of editing tools that cut DNA. And so that's probably not that critical if you're just making one change. But if you're making two, three, four changes at the same time, you're quite likely to cause a high frequency of translocations. And then you don't really know what those may do in terms of adverse effects or side effects over a period of time. So basically, when you take these cells that you have edited, what did you see happen that enabled these patients, or at least two of them, to go through therapy and have success? We can confirm the presence of the infused cells. We can show their numbers increase over a period of days into weeks. And at the same time, the leukemia becomes undetectable. We also see evidence of the biological activity of those cells, meaning they're very active. They're releasing cytokines. This is causing fever, cytokine release syndrome, which we've had to manage in all the patients. But it's a good sign that the cells are active and they're doing a job. Now, the other thing we should say is that our second patient, unfortunately, developed some severe complications related to a fungal infection in the chest. And this we could not overcome. And unfortunately, it's very sad uh, that patient um, didn't make it. And uh, we have to acknowledge and pay tribute to his courage in going through the treatment and that of his family and understanding the risks that were involved and the complications that developed. In the patients that it worked, where are they today? So the, the first patient is almost 12 months from treatment and essentially has recovered immunity to more or less normal levels. And we think she should be able to deal with infections in the normal way. The last patient is, the follow-up is shorter, but he's been through his treatment. He went into remission, but will require careful monitoring now for the coming six to 12 months. Are these at least two teenagers considered cured from this procedure? Or where are we with this? I think we're very careful about using the word cure. Um, cure is something usually we, we talk about in the rear view mirror after a period of time. These are patients under active follow-up and monitoring. Having said that, the longer we are from the time of the procedure and the longer the patient remains in remission, the more confident we can be about saying there's going to be a long-term success. So, so let's talk about what's been achieved here and what is the potential here. There's two important movements in the science and in possible clinical care. From the human level and the patient level, we've been able to bring a new treatment into play for a group of patients that would otherwise not have an option and then at the technology level, this is a first application of base editing in a human therapy. And from that point of view, hopefully it'll be a, a marker for others that will come for a wider number of conditions down the line. And what we'd like to do is, is recruit the rest of the patients for the phase one uh, study, which is normally around 10 patients to demonstrate the reproducibility of this. And we've got a related version that's just about to open for patients with a different type of leukemia called AML. And there's already a, a study running to try and treat one of the cholesterol pathways to try and lower cholesterol levels in patients that have otherwise got very high levels. And so you can see the applications being not just in rare diseases, but one would have promise for a larger number of patients. In fact, almost every condition that affects the development of the blood, bone marrow, immune systems, there's, there's dozens of genes that could be amenable to correction using some of these techniques. CRISPR was only discovered in 2012, and base editing was only reported in 2016, and we're already treating patients 
successfully in some of these situations with these platforms. Thank you so very much for speaking to us. Thank you. No problem at all. It was a pleasure. That's Dr. Wasim Qasim. He's a pediatric immunologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Next time, the state of primary care. Why have these doctors reached a breaking point and what can be done about it? It's turned us into a a widget factory of just throughput, getting people in, getting people transferred onto money-making specialties without really addressing their healthcare needs. And it's demoralizing and it's not good care. That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum.